Okay. You also have to imagine me, a former sewer worker at an ironworks in the East Midlands, making his first venture out of a changing room at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in a pair of ballet tights and pumps. The embarrassment was made somewhat easier to deal with because everyone else was in the same situation, and there was a definite feeling that no one was to laugh at anyone else. We had entered the world of one of the most eccentric movement teachers at RADA, Madame Fedra. She was then in her mid to late sixties, still very beautiful, and had a commanding presence, speaking with rich Russian vowels. Well, my darlings, she would say. I am now going to teach you to move. You will follow me. She then proceeded to walk the length of the room, and of course, I was singled out to copy her. No, no, my darling, you must move from the bowels. I'm, I'm sorry, Madame Fedra, from, from, from the, the bowels? No, my darling, the bowels, she repeated as she pointed her stick at my testicles. Billy Elliot never had to suffer this indignity. But then, fortunately for me, she then moved on to her next victim, a wonderful actress called Lynn Durth, who, I have to say, looked even worse than I did in tights. My darling, no, no, no. Can you type? Yes, madam, I can. Good, because you're going to need to when you leave here. Madame Fedra was just one of many extraordinary teachers during Hugh Crutwell's period as principal of RADA. Others included Ben Benison, my mime teacher, David Perry, Judith Jick, Gilbert Vernon. I adored them and should be forever in their debt. I obviously changed my name at RADA. It was fairly easy for me. Some of my contemporaries at RADA would suddenly turn up with the daftest names. There was a notice board where you had to clock in every morning to show that you were in attendance. Well, this went on in a fairly straightforward way for two years until the term of our finals when we were looking for agents and suddenly you'd be greeted with the most amazing names like Ambrose Silk, Honey Greensmith, Nathan Blaine Wright, Swanton Morley, Turner Shelton, Liberty Cosgrove, Walter Wilbraham, so on and so forth. In truth, I've changed the real made-up names to protect the guilty, but sheer invention was obviously the way to go. On one occasion, Boson, the main greeter at RADA, was busy on the phone directing callers to the speech department with a broad Cockney accent. Hang on, mate. Putting your fruit to speech now. I, I said to him as I was looking up at the notice board, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Boson, but what's happened to all my classmates? Have they left? No, they've changed their bloody names. Hard enough for finding people as it is. Bloody actors. Ponsers. I rang my dad on Millennium Night to celebrate the fact that I was 50, that he had a new grandson and that it was about to be the next century. Did you ever imagine that you'd be celebrating the birth of a grandson on the eve of a new century or imagine that you'd have a son of 50, I asked? He replied with the immortal line, Listen, I never imagined I'd be sleeping with a 70-year-old woman. It was during the course of the subsequent phone conversation with my mother that she had a heart attack and fell to the ground. I could hear her calling for my dad, and I was calling out to her. The phone hit the floor, no one was listening to me, and then the phone went dead. I looked around, and my wife, Rosie, was standing there with a bag saying, Go. Just go now. The journey I set off on was from my home near London to Glenfield Hospital in Leicester, because that's where I assumed she would be taken from my parents' home in Stanley Street, Ilkeston. And it was on the way to the hospital, a 90-minute near spiritual journey that I made some kind of contact with my mother. So many forgotten thoughts came back to me, reminiscences of my life, my career, a real mishmash of events. When I got to the hospital, they said, Joyce, your son Robert's here. She pulled off the oxygen mask, looked deep into my eyes, gave us all a huge smile as if embracing the whole family, and died. The events of that traumatic night acted like a catalyst for writing this book. The car dash with its rush of random memories, the idea of a generation moving on, it all mingled with those thoughts that you start to have as you get older, particularly at New Year, when you begin to reflect on your life. You see pieces of your own life in the context of your parents' lives and belatedly begin to understand them a bit more, especially as you see your own children, the next generation, growing up, moving on letting go.